All right. Good afternoon. You all know me. I'm Kevin Lemieux. I did not dress up in a suit for you today uh, because I'm going to court tomorrow. I didn't want to wear a suit two days in a row. So we're going to talk today about expert witnesses. We're going to go over foundation, cross, and direct of experts. Pretty simple stuff. Um, Pre-trial, oh, by the way, keep me on task, Adam, if you would, on time. I got 33 slides. Two of them are done already. So like two minutes a slide is all we got to hit an hour. So um, when to use an expert, it's sort of expected in any type of case that involves anything scientific, medical cases for you guys mostly. Um, when you select your expert, this is kind of a big deal. You don't just want to select somebody who's the most qualified based on their resume. You need somebody who can actually explain your position to the judge or, in Yana's case, the jury. Okay, so you, you have to have, usually we just focus on expertise. You have to figure out their communication skills. You have to talk to these people first and see if they're capable of talking in plain English or if they're just jargon heads. That's not going to do you a, a whole lot of good. Um, and you need to prepare your expert. Obviously, you need to talk about the theory of your case and the, ex the, the uh, evidence that the expert's going to need in order to prove up your theory. So, the difference between an expert and lay witness testimony is obviously lay witness testimony is based on the senses, right? It's perception testimony. Um, they can testify about what they see, hear, taste, touch, etc because they're a fact witness. So it's based on sensory perception. Experts, however, are allowed to give their opinion. It's formed via their expertise, and it's based on an analysis of the facts. The big difference is that experts can consider secondhand facts, too. So they do not have to, they don't have to have seen anything. They don't have to have heard it for themselves. They're allowed to read a medical report, read uh, what the nurse wrote about the kid, etc. They don't have to actually see it for themselves in order to form an opinion. Then uh, they evaluate those facts using some sort of a scientific process. And that's something that you can use to bolster your witness later or use to attack uh, the other side's expert witness is the process that they use. Experts, so you guys have all heard Fry Kelly in California. This is the old way of, um, I mean, look, this is a 1923 case, uh, Fry versus U.S. This is the old way. I'm not going to get in too much of, a, of an evidence lecture, but you still hear people talk about Fry and Kelly in, in court. It doesn't apply anymore. Um, in federal rule, you have federal rule 702 and Dauber. Okay, Fry no longer governs. Daubert and 702 basically make the judge a gatekeeper. Okay, so if you have a new and novel process, under Fry and Kelly, you had to prove that it was the standard, what's the, the, right here. The technique or methodology is generally accepted in the relevant scientific community. You don't have to do that anymore. 702 and Daubert makes a federal judge the gatekeeper of the evidence, okay? So the judge can decide, um, is this evidence based in reality? Is it, you know, voodoo, whatever? And you, you can end up, if there's a dispute about this, um, the only time it came up ever for me in dependency case was uh, a certain type of therapy. God, I forget what it's called. Have you guys ever had a case? It's to treat PTSD, where they make the, the person hold on to two things and they buzz them, literally. <clears throat> Uh, they, they like buzz this hand and then they buzz this hand and that the scientific theory is something that, that with trauma the way your, your brain stores traumatic events it, it's on one side of the brain and it doesn't go the other way um, and by zapping this side of your body and this side of your body it helps your brain pass it from one hemisphere to the other I forget what it's called I actually had a case um, where I put a, it was back when I was at the public defender, where I put a therapist on the stand to talk about this, and we had essentially a Daubert hearing. Um, now I was in state court, so we'll get into that. It's not Daubert, it's 801 and 803. But um, where the judge had to determine, is this real science or is it not? And before my expert was allowed to give her opinion, 
we had to go through the dauber here. So that's what that means. It's not going to come up very often for you guys. But you need to know that you no longer have to prove that it's generally acceptable in the scientific community. Instead, you have a gatekeeper. And the judge gets to consider many more factors than just the relevant scientific community when deciding whether or not your theory or process is valid. OK, so California it didn't adopt Dauber, but 720 is based on it. And 801 and 803 are the evidence codes that allow the state judge to act as a gatekeeper in the same way a federal judge would. Okay? Novel processes are subject to greater scrutiny. So if you have some, if you have some weird scientific uh, process, you're going to have to have a hearing before your trial. In a dependency case, you do it at the beginning of her testimony because there's no jury. But of course, you're going to do this in limine if you have a jury trial. 720 is the code section, evidence code 720, that most people think of when you think of expert testimony. It says a person is qualified to testify as an expert if he has special knowledge, skill, experience, there should be a comma here, skill, experience, training, or education sufficient to qualify him as an expert on a subject to which his testimony relates. I made this big, that's not in the statute. But you have to realize it's all of those things, or any one of them. We focus, we being lawyers, we tend to focus on the education part too much when straight up experience is enough. Straight up skill is enough. Training is enough. It doesn't have to be formal education. Okay? Against an objection, he must demonstrate the above in order to testify as an expert. Okay, like I said, 801 and 803 allow the court to be a gatekeeper. 801, the judge decides if the expert's subject matter is beyond the common experience and would help the jury. Okay, so if you're going to have, this allows the judge to keep out crap, basically. If you're going to have somebody who's going to come in and testify that uh, the eyewitness can see better because it's sunny and sun provides light and light helps you see better than when you're in the dark, that's not going to help the jury. This is not beyond the common experience, okay? So the judge is going to go, no, your expert's excluded. We don't need that. It has to be beyond the common experience and would assist the trier of fact. If the judge finds that the basis of the opinion, this is the gatekeeper part, if the judge finds the basis of the opinion is not a proper basis, then it's excluded. Okay, so that's your novel scientific process. Think about when DNA was first introduced, right? They're going, what the hell are you talking about? Um, so you got to prove up first. No, this is what a gene is. This is DNA. This is how we, you know, you got to have that whole um, science lesson before you even get to your trial. But even though it, it's it's written out differently, the California Evidence Code pretty much mirrors the federal rules. It's the same. So the basis of expert opinion. Experts may base their opinion on a wide variety of information. Right? Pretty simple. They can also use things that are inadmissible. Hearsay. They can consider hearsay. Right? Um, California Rule of Evidence 802 allows an expert to state the reasons for his opinion and the matter upon which it is based. This is what county council uses a lot to sneak in hearsay. They'll ask the expert, what did you base this on? The expert gets to say. I based it on the fact that blah, 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 hearsay. Now, that hearsay fact doesn't come in for the, the truth of the matter, right? It's not direct testimony. But whoever the finder of fact is gets to hear it, OK? And so remember, if, if the social worker is testifying as an expert or a doctor from Children's or whatever, and they're going to talk about the basis of their opinion, come on in. The basis of their opinion, if it's something inadmissible, like hearsay or whatever, Make sure you point that out in your closing. You know, remind your judge that piece didn't come in for its truth. You don't have uh, a witness with sensory perception to testify to that fact. It was only the basis of the expert's opinion. So in the feds, they're much more restrictive. Okay, that hearsay would not come in in a federal trial. Federal Rule of Evidence 703 
says that underlying factual basis only comes in if it's admissible on its own. Okay, so they can't start talking about hearsay in a federal trial. Um, it has to be otherwise admissible or its probative value in assessing the opinion outweighs its prejudice. Okay, your opponent can open the door for you on cross. If they open the door on cross, uh, you can talk about it. Oh, you're good. So, obviously, expert witness is just like any other witness. They're subject to direct exam and cross exam, right? Just because it's an expert up there testifying, don't forget about your rules of regular direct exam. Okay? When we're on direct, you do the six, you start all of your questions with the six honest words. Does anybody know the six honest words? Tatum, you've been through my full trial skills. What are you, I'm sorry, I wasn't listening. I know you were. <laughs> the six honest words that you start all of your questions on direct exam with one of those well, six where, words. Why? Who, what, when, where, why? And every now and then you throw in a please describe or a please explain. Okay? That's how you make sure that a direct exam <laughs> actually produces the facts that your case requires. All right, when you start asking did you, would you, could you, those questions suck on direct. That's not a good direct exam. Did you examine the child? That's a terrible question for, for a doctor. You say, what did you do when little Jimmy came into the office or whatever, you let the witness tell the story, okay? So don't forget the regular direct basics, six honest words, who, what, where, why, when, how, and every now and then, please describe, please explain. Establish their specific and their superior expertise. These are different, okay? And this is, is not always the case. Sometimes you want an expert with a more generalized expertise. Sometimes you want somebody that's very precise, and that can only be determined by the facts of your case. You have to let your witness teach the fact finder. So the kindly professor model. You want to turn your expert witness into the professor of that courtroom, okay? You're not just getting a story out of them like a sensory perception witness. You are getting them to teach your trier of fact, teach that jury or teach that judge what your theory of the case is, okay? So let them teach. You want them to translate. You're okay, you guys can walk across. Um, you want them to translate the scientific terms for your finder of fact, right? You want them to use examples in common language, demonstrative aids, things like charts and pictures and x-rays if it's a doctor. Because the rest of us, you got to think the jury, you're going to understand more about this than the finder of fact, and you're not going to understand everything the doctor's saying. You have to get them to dumb it down and teach Okay, then at the end it says get the relevant opinion. Don't forget to ask for the, you know, I was going to say something inappropriate. I want the HR person in the back. You got to ask for the big thing at the end, right? Don't forget to actually get the opinion. Uh, so what we do with the expert, first you qualify the expert, the topic and the process. You offer the expert, offer their opinion, get them to explain the opinion, then you offer the opinion again. Some of these, there's a little bit of a cart and a horse problem. Some people like to do this first. Ask the expert, you know, Dr. Reed, you're here to give an opinion today? Yes. Uh, are you prepared to give that opinion today? Yes. What's that opinion? And then they go through it. Now, you're gonna be subject to an, an objection there for lack of foundation. But that is taught, I can tell you Nita teaches people to do that, to try to get it in first. I don't really see the value in it. Um, so there's a little cart and horse problem, but you can do it either way. When you qualify the expert, 720 says, you qualify them through the knowledge, their skill, their experience, training, or education. You only need one, but if you can get them all, that's good. These are some examples. Um, this is a big one that gets overlooked a lot. Writing and publication, especially if you have a real scientist. Now, if you have a social worker, that's not going to be important. Um, 
it's, uh, we try to point out the difference in, in publications between scientific journals and like a law review journal. Let's say one of you guys who are all experts in, in something, maybe, uh, <laughs> write an article to be published on dependency law. Something about juvenile law in California, you write the scholarly articles, cite all these cases, and you send it off to uh, different law reviews throughout the country to be published in their law review. Well, that's great, okay? But it doesn't mean shit. It's just an article that you wrote. Scientific articles are different. Scientific articles actually have a thesis, and then they have a proof structure of why their thesis is true. And the only time, let's say you did this, you have a scientific thesis, and you write an article about your thesis, and you write about whatever kind of experimentation you did to prove your thesis, and then you send it off to a scientific journal for publication. It's not like the law review example. The law example is a bunch of law students, you know, second year law students are sitting around a table going, this one looks really good, it's got a lot of citations, let's pick this one, it's really long. In a scientific journal, somebody has to duplicate your, your experiment. Usually, multiple people have to duplicate your experiment in order to get it published. All right? They actually look for competitors, people who are out to try to disprove your thesis to duplicate your results. If that happens, then it gets published. So if you have a scientist of any kind, medical doctor, whatever, you want to ask if they've been published because it's a much bigger deal than it is in our field. Okay? So you want to go through that. I think it's a mistake to, especially in a jury trial, maybe it's okay with a judge, but you guys know that, that have been through my trainings before, know my feelings that if, if you're going to do it for a jury, I would generally do it for a judge. Judges are persuadable too, with maybe one exception. Um, no, no. And, but you, you can actually persuade a judge. So if you're going to do it for a jury, do it for the judge. Don't just put in your expert's resume. Have them go through at least the highlights. Don't have them go through line by line about where'd you go to high school, where'd you go to... Like, hit the big stuff at least. Um, hit their highest level of education, internships, residencies if they're a doctor, uh, all that kind of stuff. You definitely want to get their, their writing in. Um, if they've been published, get them talking about that, okay? Now, the good part. Examples of qualifying... Yeah, you know, I object to this witness. Improper foundation. I'm not aware of this person's qualifications. I'd like to uh, idea this witness as to the extent of her expertise. Granted. Trotting may proceed. Mm -hmm. Oh, mm -hmm. Mrs. Pinto, what's your current profession? I'm an out of work hairdresser. Out of work hairdresser. Now, in what way does that qualify you as an expert in automobiles? It doesn't. Well, in what way are you qualified? Well, my father was a mechanic. His father was a mechanic. My mother's father was a mechanic. My three brothers are mechanics, four uncles on my father's side are mechanics. We know your family's obviously qualified, but uh, have you ever worked as a mechanic? Yeah, in my father's garage, yeah. As a mechanic? What'd you do in your father's garage? Tune-ups, oil changes, brake relining, engine rebuilds, rebuilt some trannies, rear end. Okay, okay. But does being an ex-mechanic necessarily qualify you as being an expert on tire marks? No. Thank you. Goodbye. Sit down and stay there until you're told to leave. Alright. I'm going to pause it for a second. So, we're going into their... They got into her experience only, right? Now, um, I talked about qualifying your expert in a very specific way or in a very broad way. So on cross-examination, uh, 
Mr. District Attorney here said, how does that qualify you in tire marks? And it, that's, that's not what she's being qualified for. You're going to see it here um, in this one. But it's a distinction between what your expert, what you're actually qualifying your person to be an expert in. Okay? She's not an expert in tire marks. What did you do when you bought the girl? Tune-ups, oil changes, brake relining, engine rebuilds, rebuilt some trannies, we ran. Okay, okay. But does being one. an ex-mechanic necessarily qualify you as being an expert on tire marks? No. Thank you. Goodbye. Sit down and stay there until you're told to leave. Can you guys hear it? Yeah. yeah. Your Honor, Ms. Vito's expertise is in general automotive knowledge. It is in this area that her testimony will be applicable. Now, if Mr. Trahab wishes to voir dire a witness as to the extent of her expertise in this area, I'm sure he's going to be more than satisfied. Okay. All right. All right. Now, uh, Ms. Vito, being an expert on general automotive knowledge, can you tell me what would the correct ignition timing be on a 1955 Bel Air Chevrolet with a 327 cubic inch engine and a full barrel carburetor? It's a bullshit question. Does that mean that you can't answer it? It's a bullshit question. It's impossible to answer. Impossible because you don't know the answer. Nobody could answer that question. Your Honor, I move to disqualify Ms. Vito as an expert witness. Can you answer the question? No, it is a trick question. Why is it a trick question? Watch this. The Chevy didn't make a 327 in 55. The 327 did come out to 62. And it wasn't offered in the Bel Air with a four barrel carb till 64. However, in 1964, the correct ignition timing would be four degrees before top dead center. Well, mm -hmm. oh. She's acceptable. <laughs> now. Right, so her expertise can be challenged on an objection, uh, which it was. Qualified the expert, limited the topic, and she's been accepted. She has no formal training. No education, it's just experience. Qualifying the topic, okay, in the federal rules it's 702, it says scientific, technical, and other specialized knowledge that will help the jury, just like 803 in California, understand the evidence or determine a fact at issue. It's 801 in California, except this part. It says, beyond a common experience, it usually goes without saying, unless it's a novel topic. You shouldn't have to worry about this too much, okay, qualifying the topic. That's when the other side is saying, we don't need an expert for this. Um, but the process is important. Qualifying the process. How did you come up with that opinion, Mr. or Mrs. Expert? That's what this means, okay? A very in-depth process is more persuasive than I just compared to tire marks, right? This will strengthen your witness's opinion, okay? It gives them credibility if you can identify the scientific process that they used in order to come to their opinion. Think about the difference. In social work, it's just their opinion. I just think it's risky. The kid's at risk. Why? Because I just think he is. Because mom does drugs and they can't, there's no scientific, right? That's why we don't feel good about those opinions. That's bullshit. It's just her opinion. There's no basis, there's no factual anything that, that props that opinion up, right? Think about that as opposed to a medical opinion. When a doctor comes up and you say, and the doctor says, this is inflicted trauma, okay? Why? And then he goes into, oh, you can see on the CAT scan, the capillary, whatever it happens to be. And he'll say, and, and we did a blood test. Oh, what's the blood test for? The blood test does this, and it looks for the platelets in the book, whatever. But it's got a scientific process that backs up their opinion. It's not just, I think so. Right? So you want an expert that has this process that's in-depth, 
that you can talk about on the stand, that makes their opinion exponentially more strong. An example is George Wilbur, if you guys remember in My Cousin Vinny, the prosecution's witness is an expert on tire marks. Ms. Vito is just an expert on general automotive knowledge. Okay, they specified that. She's not an expert on tire marks. This guy is an expert on tire marks. Okay, and they are going to go into a very in-depth process. And you'll see it's it's hard to cross-examine this guy because of that process. Did I lose? My internet? Come on. I think I lost my internet. Could act out the scene for yeah, I might have to. So, well, yeah, fuck, I don't know. That's on tape. So George Wilbur, they put George Wilbur up. And if you guys remember this, George Wilbur's a guy, I'm the, what did he say? He said, I'm, I'm oh, I forgot his title. But he works for the Federal Bureau of Investigation. He's, he's an FBI scientist. And they asked him, how did you... Uh, how did you identify these tire marks? And he said, well, I went down there and I scraped off some of the rubber off the road. Anything else? Oh. Yes, yes. The car, leaving the convenience store, spun its rear tires dramatically and left the residue of rubber on the asphalt. Now, I took a sample of that rubber and analyzed it. I also took a sample of the rubber from the rear tires of the defendant's Buick and analyzed that too. What kind of equipment did you use to uh, what kind of find equipment? this out? I used the Hewlett Packard 5710A dual column gas chromatograph with flame analyzation detectors. Uh huh. Is that thing turbocharged? <laughs> Only on the floor, Mom. <laughs> now, Mr. Wilbur, what was the uh, result of your analysis? The chemical composition between the two samples was found to be identical. Identical. So, he used some special machine, Hewlett Packard 500 chromatograph flame detection analyzers. It's so ridiculous that you can't cross, it, it, it called for a joke, you know, it's that thing turbocharged. But he laid out, I pulled this rubber, I pulled this rubber, I analyzed them, I put them through a special machine. Now, of course, if it's a real trial, you're going to ask them, what does that machine do? How does it break down? How do you know the chemical composition? Blah, blah, blah. But um, that is the process. That's identifying the process for the basis of the opinion. Okay? Then you need to elicit the opinion from your expert. Based on their education training methods you've described, you've reached a conclusion. And this is the key word with a reasonable degree of scientific certainty. If it's a medical case, you say with a reasonable degree of medical certainty. Okay, you're trying to drive the point home of certainty. All right, and then you ask them, what's your opinion? What is that opinion? The explanation of the opinion and the process qualifying the topic and the methods are all intertwined. This is what I said before the cart and the horse problem. Okay, you can do the opinion first. Um, you could then you've got to go back and do the, the qualifying of the expert and qualifying of the topic. I think it works better if you do it in order. Nita wants you to get the opinion first. Uh, I don't agree. Pre-trial litigation can solve some of this. If there is an issue with the topic, that's going to be dealt with in limine. Um, this is a big one. This is the kindly professor model that I talked about a few minutes ago. You need your expert to explain it in regular English, okay? Just like you in, in, in your closing arguments, if you're in front of a jury anyways, 
you need to stop talking like a lawyer, right? If you're examining a witness, you don't ask them, you know, uh, subsequent to your walking. No, you don't say subsequent to when you're crossing. You go, so after that, you cross the street, right? That's how you talk when you're in a jury trial. You don't talk like a lawyer. You need to get your expert witness to do the same thing. You've got to tell him, Doc, stop talking like a doc. You need to explain it to us because no one knows what the hell you're saying, right? So get them to explain it in plain English. The jury should reach a conclusion right along with the expert. You're going to see the jury's going to do that with Miss Vito in a couple of minutes. Um, but you want them to be able to follow along. Right? Set it up. Elicit the opinion from the expert again. All right? So if you get it in the beginning, get it in the end again. Pound it home. Obviously, it's asked and answered, but too bad. Do it again. Use visual aids. All right? You two guys have been through this with me and Pat where he cut his finger off. I had a guy I teach with who cuts his, who cut his finger off. He puts his actual x-ray up there of his hand missing a finger with crazy screws, and it's disgusting. That is much more persuasive than just saying I cut my finger off and there were screws and it was disgusting. If you could see a picture of how disgusting it is, if you could see a picture of the screws and how it like, right? Use visual aids. Dramatically improves the comprehensibility. People need to understand what your guy is saying. On cross, you always hear the term, don't fence with Zorro. What's that mean? Somebody, anybody? Don't challenge the expert in their own area of expertise. Yeah. I mean, you've studied whatever your topic is. This is your case, you're in trial. You know this, right? So you're ready to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the, the expert. But you're never going to win that battle. I mean, their basis of knowledge in whatever the subject matter is is so much deeper than yours that you're only going to dig a hole. So don't try to out-expert the expert. I miss one though. No. Um, don't try to out expert the expert. Just attack them for what you can attack. Don't get into a discussion. That's what your expert's for, right? You're never going to get this guy to admit whatever your proposition is. So don't even try. Same thing, the rule of lay witness cross. Um, I forget who it was. It might be Jerry Spence, some, some famous lawyer said the best cross-examination is no cross-examination, right? Because cross is dangerous. Nobody really ever won their case on cross. You win your case on direct. That's the evidence you're putting forth, right? You're not eliciting evidence on cross. You're only attacking on cross. You can't win on cross. You need to put evidence in the win. That comes on direct. Nobody's ever won their case on cross, but a whole lot of people have lost a case on cross. All right, so you want to be limited as much as possible. Ask only what you must and sit down. Make sure you keep control, even more so than with a lay witness. You need to make damn sure you're using leading questions, every question, because you don't want that witness going off on the topics that you're not asking about, right? You guys remember the stop signs? If you've been in my regular cross-exam training, some of the ways you can get people to stop talking when you don't want them to talk anymore, you're the lawyer, you're in control. The thing I tell people to do is I give them the, the, the physical stop sign. Or two hands, I do two hands a lot. You just look at the witness and go, you don't even have to say anything. You know, you tell them with your eyes, hold on. Hey, whoa, what, what's happening right now? Go like that, they'll shut up. And if they don't, you say, excuse me. You're, it's okay to interrupt. Now, some judges, don't like you to interrupt, that would be your last resort. Um, some lawyers will ask the judge, Your Honor, can you instruct the witness to not, you know, to not speak when there's not a question pending or something? I call that the run to mommy for help method. Don't do that. You're in control. It's your cross-examination. You tell the witness. You don't get to talk unless I ask you a question. Okay? We understand the rules. And if they're going off on a tangent, you go, excuse me, that's not what I asked you. You know, when I asked you something else. You don't have to be offensive about it. You'll see, actually, Joe Pesci's going to do it. I think I have the clip. Um, you don't have to be an, you don't have to be an asshole about it. Just do it. Just say, whoa. 
we're going off in another direction. And, and you could be nice. You can go, look, I'm sure your lawyer, or I'm sure the lawyer for whoever is going to get into all that with you. But all I'm asking you is this, right? So control. Make sure you use leading questions. If you ask a who, what, when, where, why, how question, and the expert goes off on a tangent, it's your own fault. And you don't get to object non-responsive when you ask an open-ended question. They just get to go. And you sit there and take it. Be precise, one fact per question only, right? That's how you keep control. Know your theory of the case. This, get your own expert. You know, if your theory of the case is I'm going to get up there and I'm going to cross-examine Dr. Suresh or whoever and poke holes in this and we're going to win, you might as well, we all know you, you know you're not going to win, right? If you don't have your own expert, you're not going to win. You can't win on cross with an expert. It's impossible. Okay, you can present them with new facts or bad facts. You can present them with hypotheticals. Okay, that's different than a lay witness. You can do that with experts. You can point out if they're a hired gun. I don't know how persuasive that is to juries. I don't think it's persuasive at all to the judges. Um, but the basic techniques, leading, one topic, and I always tell people, don't be cross on cross. It's okay to be nice. You don't want to look like an ass in front of the jury. Right? Even if it's a bench trial, you don't want to look like an ass in front of the judge. So be nice. You can still keep control. Be nice. Your theory of the case, you want to render the opposing expert irrelevant by having a theory that renders their opinion irrelevant. You guys got to go to court. Don't worry. Um, so the, the easiest example I can think of is a DUI case where they're talking about your client's blood alcohol level and the science behind it. And uh, if your theory of the case was, oh, that's great, yeah, he was hammered, but my client wasn't the one driving, then that uh, obvious, that expert testimony doesn't matter. That's just kind of the most obvious thing I could think of. Trying to out as expert, their expert is a mistake. That's the same as fencing with Zorro. You guys aren't doing this enough because I didn't do it enough when I was here either. All right? Your expert helps you to understand the topic, prepare cross questions for the other expert, and present your opposing testimony. You should be spending, if it's a medical case, you should be on the phone for an hour with your expert, you know, a couple of weeks before your trial. Adam will pay for, I hear Adam's really loose with the checkbook around here. He'll pay for an extra hour with your expert, but you need to get them on the phone and you need to tell them, look, this is what Children's Hospital is saying. You're telling me something different, Dr. Grogan. Explain to me, how, what am I going to ask this lady on cross? He'll tell you. Right? But not if you don't spend, not if you don't call him up and say, I need a phone call with you a week before trial. Right? And you got to get him to explain it to you. All right, if you're talking about the, the shaken baby metaphyseal corner fraction, uh, corner fracture on the, on the knee there that the agency always sees, and if you have Dr. Grogan, you know that differing, there's different opinions on whether that fracture even exists. You've got to get him to explain it to you. How are you going to ask questions of the children's hospital doctor if you don't understand what's going on, right? So pay your expert for more than just your trial. How am I doing on time, Adam? I think I'm ahead of schedule, no? Yeah, you know, pretty good. All right. Um, so do this more. I promise you Adam will pay. Present the other side's expert with new or different facts. Okay? It kind of makes them look bad. You might weaken their opinion. You might change their opinion. Here's the example I give you, okay? Especially, hey, if there's new facts and they don't know about it, they're going to be pissed at their side. But here's an example. Bruising case. Doctor, would your opinion of inflicted trauma be different if you knew this child was severely vitamin K deficient? Right now, this has to come from your expert. I'm not a doctor. I don't know that it would, that bruising matters with vitamin K deficiency. But if my expert says, no, 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 the reason why their guy is wrong is because this kid was vitamin K deficient. And then I'm going to ask my expert, here's what I'm going to ask her. Would your opinion be different if you knew this kid was severely vi uh, vitamin K deficient? 
and he's going to go good. And I say, what if she says no? It wouldn't change. What, where is she going? What, what is her theory? And he's going to explain it all to you so that you can attack, right? It has to come from your expert. You're just plain not smart enough in whatever the topic is in order to do this on your own. Even Beth. Isn't it true, this is the hired gun attack, isn't it true that you're being paid by the other side to be here? I don't think it's a very powerful way to attack on cross, the other side's expert. I think everybody knows they're getting paid. You're getting paid, I'm getting paid, the judge is getting paid, everybody in the room's getting paid. To be here? Yeah, it might work if it's outrageous. One of the things to look for is here, 722 in California. It says, you can inquire about compensation and expenses. This is the one that gets missed, okay? If the guy's compensation or the gal's compensation is, is kind of normal, but they're staying, they flew in first class from New York and they're staying at a super swanky hotel and they get $100 a day or $100 of meal money, meal money, maybe that would offend a juror, I don't know. But you're allowed to ask about it. I don't think it, I don't think it demonstrates bias to the, to the point that, that other people think it does. I don't, I don't think it's all that strong. This is stronger, I think. Isn't it true you've never testified for a parent and for your dependency people or for a plaintiff if you're a civil person? That might have a little bit more um, showing of bias. Have the expert validate your expert recalls. Cross-expert validation. Okay, in dependency, it comes up a lot because all these people know each other. So if you've got, I keep using Dr. Grogan as an example, if you've got Dr. Grogan testifying about broken bones and you have Dr. whoever, Shiresh or whoever from Children's Hospital on the stand, you can ask them, you're familiar with my expert, aren't you? Yes. You read his opinion in this case? Yes, I did. Um, and you can go through it. You don't dispute her methodology. You understand he reviewed this, 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 and, and you can get into that that magnetic chromograph with flame detectors that George Wilbur talked about. You, you understand what that machine is, right? And you can say, my doctors, uh, are, are you, especially if they work together or something like that, but you could say, you know, my expert is the head of pediatric uh, bone, bone orthopedic. orthopedic, pediatric orthopedics at Shriners Hospital in Los Angeles. You're aware of that, right? Yeah. He's a well-respected doctor, isn't that right? Yeah. And you could say, now, I understand you don't agree with him on this particular case, but you would agree that he's well-respected in this field. They're going to say yes. Use of treatises. Uh, this, came, this bit me in the ass once in trial. Cross-examination of an expert can include inquiry into the treatises. This is the kicker upon which the expert relied, okay? So California Evidence Code 721 allows the use of treatises if they relied on it or if they admit its reliability, okay? So this is something else you want to ask your witness. Does so-and-so's opinion go against the typical published data on this, right? And if they say yes, say, get point me to it. Give me a treatise or something, all right? Uh, and if they admit that, yeah, yeah, that's a reliable treatise, you're allowed to hammer them with it, okay? This bit me, uh, Kristen Baxter got me with this once because she got, I don't remember who my expert was, but she got my expert to admit that some bullshit treatise was reliable and she just went through it all and it was all counter to my guy's, uh, my gal's opinion. So watch out for it, but you can use it. Federal rule is pretty much the same. Here's the cross of Mr. Wilbur. Now, if you guys remember my cousin Vinny, Vinny's only defense throughout the case was that two identical guys, two, two look-alike guys in an identical car went into the sack of suds five minutes after my guys left, and they're the ones that shot the clerk. Right? Two different guys in the same kind of car. That's his theory of the case. Mr. Wilbur's still on a stand. You heard him. He scraped the rubber from the tire and from the road and ran it through the chromatic graph, Hewlett Packard 900 with dual flame analyzer detectors, and they're identical. So 
uh, Joe Pesci knows I, I can't I can't attack that process. That thing sounds uh, you know I don't have somebody who did that. Boom. <laughs> Very, very little. Something? Nothing. Is it possible that two separate cars could be driving a Michelin model XGV 75R14s? Of course. Let me ask you this. What's the best-selling single model tire being sold in the United States today? The Michelin XGV. And what's the most popular size? 75 R14. The same size as on the defendant's car. But two faded green 1964 Buick Skylark convertible. Excuse me. What I'm asking you is if the most popular size of the most popular tire is on the defendant's car. Well, hmm. yeah. Yes. Um, thank you. No further questions. Not too powerful, right? Uh, the witness can stand down. He didn't attack. Uh, there was nothing, you know, didn't do a whole lot. But that's his theory. His theory is two different guys in the same kind of car did it. All he's trying to say is, isn't it possible there's two other guys? So, now there's a different kind of expert. Now we go back to Miss Mona Lisa Vito. We had the unusual foundation process where it's, her expertise is only in her experience. There's no underlying data, but she does refute the defense theory. She uses plain language and examples. She doesn't talk like George Wilbur from the Federal Bureau of Investigation. All right? Um, and at the end, Vinnie recalls Mr. Wilbur and says, everything she say, Correct? He goes, yeah. Ms. Vito, please answer the question. Does the defense's case hold water? Not a great question. No. The defense is wrong. Are the karate kids so deflated? Are you sure? I'm positive. How could you be so sure? Because there is no way that these tire marks were made by a 64 Buick Skylark. These marks were made by a 1963 Pontiac Tempest. Objection, Your Honor. Can we clarify to the court whether the witness is stating opinion or fact? This is your opinion? It's a fact. It's fact. It's I fact. find it hard to believe that this kind of information could be ascertained simply by looking at a picture. Would you like me to explain? I would love to hear this. So would I. The car that made these two equal length tire marks had positive traction. Can't make those marks without positive traction, which was not available on the 64 Buick Skylark. And why not? What is positive traction? It's a limited slip differential which distributes power equally to both the right and left tires. The 64 Skylark had a regular differential, which anyone who's been stuck in the mud in Alabama knows you step on the gas, one tire spins, the other tire does nothing. Is that it? No, there's more. You see, when the left tire mark goes up on the curb and the right tire mark stays flat and even, well, the 64 Skylark had a solid rear axle. So when the left tire would go up on the curb, the right tire would tilt out and ride along its edge. But that didn't happen here. The tire mark stayed flat and even. This car had an independent rear suspension. Now, in the 60s, there were only two other cars made in America that had positive traction and independent rear suspension and enough power to make these marks. One was the Corvette, which could never be confused with the Buick Skylark. The other had the same body length, height, width, weight, wheelbase, and wheel track as the 64 Skylark, and that was the 1963 Pontiac Tempest. And because both cars were made by GM, were both cars available in metallic mint green paint? Mm -hmm. They what? Thank you, Ms. Vito. No more questions. Thank you very, very much. You've been a lovely 
lovely witness. She explained in plain English what she's doing right, what's a positive traction, it means both tires spin at the same time. If you have, if you don't have positive traction, only one spins. Anybody who's been stuck in the mud in Alabama. So that's what you're looking for from your expert. Somebody who can explain it to the masses. Even though she's a little unconventional. Now, we're wrapping it up here. Um, this is something I wanted to point out, especially to dependency experts, because I was lying before when I said that Adam would be very liberal with the, the checkbook and let you hire experts and uh, pay them for an extra hour to prep you. Um, we know he's, his, uh, he's a little tight with the money. <laughs> there is, in California, court-appointed experts. And the more I was thinking about this, the more um, I realized, I don't know why we don't do this more, but there is a little bit of a gamble in asking the court for a court-appointed expert. If you have a medical case, something that's that type of an expert, not a social worker expert, but something like uh, a medical case, you can ask the court by motion. I mean, the court can do it on its own too, but you file a motion asking the court to appoint a court-appointed expert. Okay, It's a little bit of a gamble because that expert is essentially going to be your tiebreaker between your expert and whoever the... Uh, the county pulls up. And depending on your judge, um, you know, she might just pick somebody else at, at Children's Hospital. But if you got nothing else and your case is kind of tight, you could ask the court for a court appointed expert witness. Okay? You can nominate somebody or stipulate to the witness. And then any party can call them on direct, any party can cross in the jury. If it's a jury case, the jury is told that this is the court's expert, which technically doesn't mean anything. There's no jury instruction that says you give the court's expert more weight than you give the defense expert or the plaintiff's expert. But in reality, that's exactly what the jury is going to do. They're going to, oh, that's the judge's expert. It's 7.30 in California, 7.06 in the feds. Thank you. Um, Follow me, Advocacy Training Center, Facebook, Twitter, all that jazz. YouTube channel, please subscribe. Is there any questions about experts, foundation-wise? No, cross or direct. You guys are experts. I get it. All right, thank you.